From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 236, recorded live Thursday, October 7th, 2010. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Mike Amundsen about REST. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today we have the pleasure of sitting down with Mike Amundsen. He's a well-known author and lecturer. He's got a dozen books under his belt, and um, most recently the O'Reilly book, Restful Web Services Cookbook, and he's going to talk to me about REST today. Thank you, sir, for taking the time to chat. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to talk to you, Scott. So let's start at the beginning. Let's assume I know what, what SOAP is. I know what web services are. And I've been spending some number of years pushing angle brackets around the wire, making request messages and response messages with, with SOAP. What is REST and how is it different? Well, it's a, it's a good question. So just to start with, REST, unlike SOAP, REST is actually just a style so it's a uh, style like Gothic or Swedish Modern or Cubist. So it's not a standard. It doesn't have any uh, standards like SOAP would have. It's also not a protocol like HTTP or something like that. So uh, REST is really a style that's applied to network architecture or architectural style. Um, so... It's it's different in that sense, but very often it's uh, considered a pattern or a way to build applications themselves. So that sounds like immediately something that could be argued about, because with SOAP, there's, you know, there's RPC, and there's document literal, and it's either SOAP or it's not. It's valid or it's not. We have trouble interoperating, but it's not really something that one gets to argue about. Something's either valid SOAP or it's not. But if something is Gothic or Cubist, two art fans could stand in front of something and argue about, oh, I think that's the Cubist. Does that happen yes. in REST? Do people argue about it? Yes, constantly. In fact, it's the uh, primary source of entertainment for some. Uh, because it is a style, it does definitely lend itself to lots of interpretation, and that's both the beauty and the curse of working in something like that. But it's well along the lines of, other, you know, architectural styles such as uh, pipe and filter or what used to be called C2 or component and connector, which was, you know, very popular during the local network or uh, age. So it's, it's not uh, like it's totally unidentifiable. In matter of fact, it might be the case that I know it when I see it or something like that. But there's certainly lots and lots of room for argumentation and interpretation. But, but with all styles, someone uh, is typically recognized as the creator of that style. And you could, you know, you, I love your example of, you know, cubism versus gothic versus Swedish. Da, da, da. You could say, well, this is the person who innovated in that space first. Why don't we just go to the guy who invented rest and then he will settle all of our arguments? Yes, that, that's true. And actually, there is a guy who, who coined the term, uh, Roy Fielding, in a dissertation 10 years ago, Actually, in one chapter of a, I think it's a six or seven chapter dissertation on network style analysis, coins rest as a particular style. And there are lots of people who appeal to Roy. It's sort of like, well, what would Roy do? Or what did Roy say? Commonly in the discussions, it's the appeal to authority model. Well, you know, Roy wouldn't do that or something like that. So that goes on quite a bit. But Fielding's dissertation outlines the details of, of, the particular style he mentions, and um, actually, I think quite successfully, points out the what he calls the constraints that make up the style. In other words, if you follow this series of constraints, and he gives reasons for why each one should exist, then that's a particular style that he calls rest. Okay, so let's try to get into the the the, uh, the concrete for those who maybe haven't gotten uh, a sense yet of what this is. The, what is what is rest? What did he describe, and what does it look like 
with the with HTTP kind of at its core. Yeah. Um, basically, what what Fielding was talking about is the idea that there's a there's a particular style for distributed network applications that can be very effective and very efficient, and he outlines a series of steps and uses. Uh, after he after he outlines these steps, uses HTTP as the example. So, so he actually has a chapter on the style and a chapter on whether or not the style is actually matches HTTP very well or not. And he does this because he was actually working on the HTTP spec while he was writing his dissertation. They're kind of cross uh, fertilizing quite a bit. But to be more specific, he actually names uh, just a handful of uh, constraints or particular items that would identify something as a restful style uh, architecture. So it's, it's like, you know, relatively general terms, like it's a client server app. It uses stateless messaging back and forth. It employs a cache or can support a cache uh, in between any participants in the network. It's got a very limited interface between parties. And uh, it also uh, is built as a layered system, so systems can join at any time or leave at any time without breaking anything. And then it's got an extra step of uh, it's possible that if none of this works perfectly, you can actually send code between parties, mobile code or code on demand. That's sort of his, you know, minimal set of what he calls constraints that make up that REST style. So when I encounter REST or get into arguments around about REST in the wild, I typically hear it expressed as, well, they took CRUD, create, read, update, delete, and they uh, basically mapped it to some existing verbs in HTTP and post, put, delete, and get, and it all, it, it all maps very nicely, you know, read is get, and yada, 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 and, and that's REST. Why is that yeah. such a common explanation if it's more complicated than that? Yeah, it's actually more complicated, and in some ways, following the CRUD pattern can lead you sort of down the wrong path You're gonna, if you're going to be a REST purist type. REST actually doesn't talk at all about read, write, update, or delete, or any of those kinds of things. And it really talks uh, only in comparison about HTTP. Actually, a lot of what we commonly talk about in the wild as REST, we're really talking about HTTP, which is a standard. There's definitely a right and wrong. There are definitely things you must and may and should and may not and do and all those kinds of things. So very often when I end up talking to folks, we're really sort of slipping into talking about a protocol called HTTP rather than REST itself. Okay, so with HTTP, there's and kind of an implied envelope, because the body of the message itself is an envelope. HTTP has headers, while with SOAP, SOAP had its its own enveloping system, So because it was um, protocol neutral. I could take a SOAP message and the headers in the body, and I could take it around, I could put it in an MQ, I could email a SOAP message. Does, does REST uh, need HTTP and its associated metadata, or can I apply REST to another protocol? Right, so it, it's actually that's a that's a great sort of summary of some comparisons about one application protocol to another, the SOAP pattern to the HTTP pattern, right? So HTTP has this header space, this metadata space, and then the body of, of itself, the actual message, right? And um, REST itself doesn't make any direct uh, claims except to say that you know Roy's architectural model makes a big deal about data itself as part of the ne network architecture. You've got components that do work, connectors that talk to each other, and data as another component for the architecture. So to Roy, the idea of moving data around, it's not actually just the, the information, but it's also the metadata. The, there are request uh, metadata, there's response metadata, there's metadata about the message I itself. So there's lots of extra stuff. So in that sense, HTTP then has this set of what they call headers. That's where they store metadata. And then there's the body of the message itself. And that looks very, very similar to uh, SOAP. SOAP does the same thing because SOAP has uh, extensions and SOAP headers and all those other things that are very similar. Uh, SOAP does it all as a single message because, again, they want it to be a to be able to cross different protocols. HTTP is really that same whole picture for one application protocol. 
Okay, so I can easily apply REST to other protocols? You never hear about people emailing REST messages or putting REST messages on in mainframes. Right. Um, well, there, that's because there's not really a REST message, right? There's a message that has these bits, but REST is, the, is sort of the, the architectural pattern. Yeah, you can apply that REST pattern to, to more than one particular application-level protocol. Um, if we talk about the, the various pieces of what Roy points out as the protocol, the client server, the stateless, the cache, the uniform interface, those can exist without uh, any particular protocol. They can, they can be uh, something else. I'm sure that HTTP won't be around forever, and uh, you could still use the same architectural pattern for some other kind of protocol. This is the part of the show where I mock you. Well, actually, Telerik mocks us. Your applications that you're testing dependent on external systems over which you have no control? Maybe you're being slowed down by those systems? Their lack of availability responsiveness? You want to do TDD right? Our friends at Telerik help you solve some of those problems with their newest mocking tool, Just Mock. It'll let you do fast, simple, controlled unit tests independent of external resources like databases, web services, proprietary code. Unlike some mocking tools, Just Mock works with non-virtual methods, sealed classes, Static methods, giving you complete control of your code. You can get more details. You can download Just Mock at Telerik.com slash Just Mock. And don't forget to thank Telerik for supporting Hanselman. It's on their Facebook fan page, Facebook.com slash Telerik. Thanks a lot. I see a lot of people creating systems that they, they say are REST, uh, but then they end up being what other people call POCs, just plain old XML, where you do a get and some angle brackets come back. And they say, look at my RESTful system that I've built. Is, is POX a bad thing, or can they call that? Are they allowed to call that REST? Right. Is POX a bad thing? No. Um, can you call it REST? Yeah, you could. But sort of just like you could say, hey, this, this is my cubist painting. But I think one, one, of the things, one of the things I mentioned in the list of, that Roy outlines in his dissertation, what he calls his constraints, is the uniform interface. And that uniform interface has a lot to do with how uh, messages uh, are sent around or how components and connectors talk to each other. And one of the items he mentions that is a part of that interface is the notion of hypermedia as the engine of application state or hypermedia constraint. And hypermedia is the links that we have inside a message, the links that tell us what we can do next, the link that tell us what's possible. Can I send a search? Can I make a query? Can I write data to the server? And typically the POX pattern or POCO or POJO or any of those terms um, don't contain that hypermedia information or that hyperlinking information, and, and that's what separates it. Uh, Fielding makes a big deal about how important hypermedia is in order to make his particular style of network architecture work. So would something like Atom Pub be a hypermedia document in that in that it's a it's an XML document with links that describe what you could potentially do to that document? Absolutely. And that, that's a great example. You've got um, two two specs, right? You've got the Atom syndication format and then you've got Atom Pub. And that Atom Pub RFC, that documentation actually explains how to locate links inside a message and what those links, how to understand what those links mean. You've got rel equals edit, for example, or you've got rules about how you can create a message, which link to find inside a return message in order to know how to create a new item in the collection. So that document is specifically documenting the hypermedia aspect of an Atom message. So Atom is a great example of a hypermedia format that works very well in this RESTful architectural style. So given the RESTful architectural style, that, that it's out there, it exists, and it's reasonably well understood, although there is not a sample application I can get, there's nothing I can point to that says, this is perfect, this is the pinnacle. If I were to go and design something like a bank, and I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, or at least on the shoulders of one guy with a PhD, what does REST give me to start with when I sit down and I say, file new project, or I start whiteboarding? Where do I start? Right, and, and, uh, and that's, that's a great question. When you think about it, whenever you start to build a, uh, you know, a large scale system, you're going to start asking yourself, am I going to start, am I going to use client server? Am I going to support caches? Am I going to, um, 
support some kind of limited interface between all the components that they all understand, you're really developing an architectural style. And you can do that from scratch each time and identify uh, properties of a system that you like, such as all the components can talk to each other or messages can be cached and replayed later kind of thing, and then decide the constraints that you need. Or you can start from existing uh, models like uh, Fielding's model example in his fifth chapter of his dissertation and start from there and maybe take that whole cloth or take that and modify it in any way you see fit. So it, in building a bank, I might say, well, do I need to have, uh, do I need to communicate across lots and lots of clients, uh, uh, support pub- maybe lots and lots of servers and things that I don't own myself? If I, if I can't build all those parts, This restful style that has these disconnected components where data is just important as a component probably works really well as a starting place. Mm. What kind of misunderstandings would I bump into? Like what, what, what's a major mistake that is commonly made if I were, if I were building this system? Oh, that's a, that's a great, that's a great question that, that could go on for a while, but I can tell you when I talk to folks, the, the sort of the misunderstanding pattern um, is, and I think we mentioned this earlier, the idea that often what we're really talking, what we want to talk about is the application protocol HTTP and not the, the network style REST. So a lot of times when you're discussing things, it's important to know, you know, which one you're, you're focused on. But I think some typical examples are... Uh, when I see people talk about doing REST, very often they say, well, I've got really well-designed URLs, or they call them URIs in the, you know, in the, sometimes. So I've, I've, I've made sure that I've got the right slashes and names and all those kinds of things. And it turns out in this uh, architectural style that Fielding talks about, the, the actual details of the URL don't matter at all. There's nothing important except for the very large grained. There's a protocol front end. There's a na- domain name server. There's a domain server name. There's some uh, segments that have slashes, and there's some stuff that goes after it. That's all REST cares about. It can be all GUIDs, and it doesn't matter. So the idea of spending a lot of time uh, crafting URIs that's not going to get you any closer to REST than than doing anything else. That's that's one of the biggest ones. I think the second one is the idea that what REST really talks about is this notion of mapping CRUD activity to an application protocol like HTTP. And again, REST mm-hmm. doesn't even talk about CRUD. It doesn't talk about those, those items at all. It, so spending a lot of time figuring out which uh, uh, HTTP method goes with which URI is not really going to improve the situation a lot either. So I think those are the two biggest ones that I see coming out of discussions about this. Okay, so hang on. So this is a big deal here. You've just said that worrying about how pretty your URIs are is not something that's going to get you closer to to REST in its purest sense. Yeah, or, or in any and, sense, because REST doesn't talk about what the URIs ought to look like. In fact, it's really important that both client and server not get bound up in exactly what the URI looks like. If you think about the fact that I'm writing the client and you're writing the server, you want to make sure as a server writer, if you need to move that to another server or if you need to change some kind of technology in some way, that you can safely do that and that my client won't break just because you changed a couple of letters in a URI. That's a restful uh, aspect of, of, a, of an architectural style. So if I, as a client, get all excited about your documentation about, about what a URL looks like, I could be in a lot of trouble if you ever move your server. So now I feel like you've kind of pulled the rug out from under me, and I've got nothing to hold on to. Uh, people are always saying restful URIs and how fortunate it is that these URIs are so so neat. They think of, like, they the, the term restful URIs is kind of, uh, hackable or friendly, that you should spend time thinking about what your URI looks like such that it is a uh, almost a user interface element, and that's not an, a component of, of REST as a pattern at all. No, it's, it's not a component of REST at all. I think, I think it was uh, Tim Berners-Lee has a, has a great piece on the web about, uh, what is it, uh, cool URIs don't change, right? And that doesn't have anything to do with an architectural style. It has to do with Tim's uh, focus on the notion that um, once you put a URI out there, you can't really take it back, or you you, you shouldn't just change things willy-nilly. 
And that's certainly important, but um, rest as this pattern or as this architectural view isn't re- really concerned about the actual details of what they look like, just that clients and servers know how to locate them and understand what they mean or what they represent, and that's the exciting part. So when I talk to people about this hypermedia pattern, it doesn't matter what href equals, but it does matter what rel equals, because that's what a client can bind to. If it says rel edit, I can take whatever that, that URI is, and I know that that's the URI to use for editing a particular record. That's the exciting part. I see. So now I feel like we're getting to uh, something I can I can use. The the fact that I can refer to other things that I can do with that that message, like you said, rel equals edit, and I can say I have some 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 resource uh, a book, and I want to edit that book. Now I know what the the URI is for that book. If the URI is not going to change, if Tim Berners Lee says respect the permalink, does it really matter if it's in that rel equals edit? Can't it just be a convention, and then I don't need to mention it at all? Sure. If, if you're sure that that will never change, you can probably tell all your clients to write that in. I mean, they can code it right into the hard code, right? Mm-hmm. But if you think that might change, you, you want to make sure that your, your clients don't get stuck if something goes along the way, like you have to redeploy everything. Think if we had to redeploy browsers every time somebody changed a website, right? You don't want that. So, yeah, th- and this is exactly what you start to think about, going back to your bank idea. If, if you're sure that these things will never change, that's an aspect of your architectural style when you build servers and clients that you don't need to focus on. Mm, okay. In reality, I think not, nobody can guarantee that that stuff isn't going to change at some point. It's possible, though. Um, are there some examples of some really good APIs that you that you point to and you say, ah, they really got it right? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And uh, to be honest, there, there's a couple of things. Really good, I would say one of the ones that I really like to work with is one that I'm not sure a lot of people know about. It's called FriendFeed. So it's another one of these aggregator services. But mm-hmm. FriendFeed's uh, uh, initial interface, like its HTML interface, actually Mm -hmm. works very much like its API, and I think they do a very, very good job with that. I think they do a good job in the way they do logins and the way they they add links to their replies and stuff like that. So I think that's a pretty good example. Uh, Gmail or Google does an awful lot of really, really good things as well. Most uh, Atom-based systems also do a very good job as long as they focus on, you know, returning links in those uh, payloads. You're really doing a very good job of making it possible for new clients to be built uh, using just the spec and not knowing all the details for, for, for having new servers join up or, or things like that. So I think those are, those are some really good examples. Is this ever going to get easier? I mean, because it's a style, it's always going to be someone's opinion about whether or not I did it the right way. Well, I would say um, what you want to think about, and I've talked to a few people who do this, is... You may not want to become a follower of this particular style. In other words, you don't, you may not say, I'm going to write rest from now on. Actually, Roy's dissertation is not about rest. Rest was the example. What his dissertation about was how to analyze existing architectural styles and how to actually identify styles in existing systems. And really, the idea behind all that was in order to come up with a working pattern for creating your own architectural style that's reasoned and, uh, you know, solves the problems you want to solve. It turns out people got really excited about that one chapter, and I've actually heard him in a couple of cases say he was rather frustrated by that because his dissertation is really about network style analysis, not about one particular example he gave. But I know people who, again, going back to your bank example, use Roy's dissertation as a lead on how they can identify properties they want to induce in a large system, constraints that they need to place on the way components and connectors and data is is, uh, handled in order to get those properties, and they end up inventing their own very well-reasoned and very successful style. And I think that's the goal that everybody really wants. They don't want to 
just say, I'm doing a particular style. They want something that really solves their own problem. Well, it definitely sounds that we should stop using REST as a weapon and remember that it's a style and not something that you can go and you know, run a test against or compile and say, look, it compiled, it's REST. Right, exactly, exactly right. Treat it as an example for creating a reasoned architecture that solves your problems. And I think then it becomes a really handy, really handy uh, thing to work with. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mike, for, for spending time with us on the show today. I enjoyed it. It's good to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes. I'll see you again next week.